On the screen now is a list of current and relevant chipsets for our audience. This is primarily to establish the point of view of why we need to clarify what each of these provides. There are a lot of chipsets with similar names now, different socket types, and similar features. So we're here to define, first of all, what a chipset is in TLDR fashion, with a later piece to explain the actual chipset differences one by one. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzlies High-End Thermal Paste and Liquid Metal. Thermal Grizzlies Cryonaut is an affordable, high-quality thermal compound that doesn't face some of the aging limitations of other pastes on the market. Cryonaut has a thermal conductivity of 12.5 watts per meter kelvin, focuses on endurance, is easy to spread, and isn't electrically conductive, making it safe to use on GPU dies. Thermal Grizzly also makes Conductonaut liquid metal, which we've used to drop 20 degrees off some temperatures in our delitted tests. Buy a tube at the link in the description below. As for what a chipset actually is, it's basically a glorified I.O. controller, and this is calling back to a GN article from 2012, but basically we described it then as the CPU being sort of a disembodied brain and the chipset being a spinal cord. The chipset carries all of the I.O. on a modern computer. They used to be split into multiple parts, we'll go over momentarily. Intel calls its chipset a PCH, or Platform Controller Hub, while AMD goes with the more generic and definitely correct term of chipset. So easy to tell them apart. Uh, they are functionally the same, they just have different acronyms or names in the case of Intel. The chipset is the center of I.O. for the rest of the motherboard. It's responsible for assigning I.O. lanes to devices like SATA, to general purpose PCIe devices, gigabit Ethernet, and to USB ports. Both AMD and Intel unified the old Northbridge and Southbridge into a single chipset. The Northbridge was previously responsible for communicating with PCIe and memory, and the Southbridge communicated with SATA and IDE, USB, firmware chips, PCI, legacy devices and audio, and about half of those are legacy devices now. So legacy, legacy devices. These days, all of these devices talk to either the CPU or the unified chipset. Also different in modern times, the memory controller has now been moved to the CPU, becoming an integrated memory controller for both AMD and Intel. Intel's IMC and AMD's SOC, or system on chip, determine whether memory slots can operate in dual channel or quad channel configurations, control the memory clocks, and manage DRAM refreshes, writing and reading operations, and have some security features related to memory. A modern chipset looks more like this Z370 block diagram from Intel. Intel connects its chipset to the CPU via an interconnect called DMI, or Direct Media Interface which was most recently revised in 2015 to use four PCIe lanes connecting the CPU to the chipset directly. This can become a limiting factor in some extreme I.O. scenarios, like those where multiple NVMe RAID SSDs might exist in a system. If you look carefully at the diagram, you'll notice that GPUs are able to bypass DMI and the chipset both, as the CPU hosts its own PCIe lanes that are assignable to graphics devices. In this example, we have 16 PCIe lanes in total available from the CPU, and we can highlight the left side of the outputs from the Z370 chipset, again connected via DMI, to get a better idea of other I.O. These are all for I.O. devices. In this scenario, we have 24 PCIe 3.0 lanes, 6 SATA 6 gigabit per second ports, options for dozens of USB ports, an integrated Mac and gigabit Ethernet connected via an SM bus and PCIe by one. All these devices are known as high-speed I.O. devices and they use HSIO lanes, as Intel calls them, but it's the same idea on AMD, just less branded. For Intel chipsets, motherboard makers get a fixed number of HSIO lanes that they can pull from the chipset and assign to different devices. Same idea again with AMD, just different naming for those lanes. The motherboard makers can decide how to assign lanes to some extent on both AMD and Intel platforms. And when deciding to do that, for instance, one motherboard maker might decide to allocate more lanes to SATA or more to something like USB, fewer to USB, more to PCIe slots, and so forth. As for graphics and PCIe off of the chipset, this is a common point of confusion for people. With Intel starting off, it's impossible to peel off more than four lanes for a PCIe slot from the chipset. So all of those PCIe graphics slots typically are coming from the CPU, and then technically you could pull some of the PCIe lanes from the chipset to fuel more PCIe slots, like in some of the mining motherboards, for example, where they just have a bunch of buy one or buy four slots. The thing is with multi-GPU, like with SLI, NVIDIA mandates a buy eight minimum for SLI to work. 
So if you only have four coming off the chipset for a graphics device, it's not gonna work with SLI and gaming. It worked fine for use cases where you don't need SLI, you just need a lot of GPUs. Again, mining being a relevant and easy example for that. So the most you get out of the chipset for graphics is four lanes, but the CPU has its own lanes that communicate directly with the graphics devices and they bypass DMI. DMI again being four lanes going to the chipset. So you're gonna bottleneck there no matter what anyway in intense IO scenarios. As for the rest, Z370 comes with 30 HSIO lanes, just as a quick example, with 24 that are assigned to PCIe, USB, SATA, and other devices like gigabit ethernet. 14 lanes are assignable by the motherboard manufacturer. They're more or less generic lanes that the motherboard maker can decide what to do with. And note that Intel PCIe chipset lanes, again, can't be assigned in greater than by four to any device. So that's always going to be your limitation. Uh, a manufacturer couldn't pull eight PCIe lanes from the chipset again to make that very clear because it is a common point of confusion. Back to our diagram, Intel also uses SPI or the Serial Peripheral Interface Bus to bridge the chipset and firmware, trusted platform modules, and XTU. Whenever you flash BIOS with a new version, that's communicated down SPI and into the physical firmware chip. Finally, on the right side of the Intel chipset diagram, we see additional I.O. support for RAID and Intel Rapid Storage Technology, or RST. You'll notice that memory doesn't directly communicate with the chipset. Instead, because modern CPUs use integrated memory controllers, or IMCs, the memory has a direct line to the CPU, just like the primary GPU does. This is much faster and eliminates painful latency that would be encountered otherwise. AMD's modern Ryzen chipsets aren't too different from Intel's. The functionality and objective remain the same, although the specific implementation is a little bit different. AMD's X370 chipset block diagram looks like this one. We'll highlight the blocks and interconnects as we go, just like we did with the Intel one. The CPU still hosts its own PCIe 3.0 lanes for direct GPU communication, just like Intel's configuration, but Ryzen has more PCIe lanes on the CPU. We have a total of 16 lanes for PCIe 3.0 graphics devices, four lanes for NVMe M.2 devices, and four lanes that the user can never directly use because those communicate with the chipset. Like Intel, the CPU has an integrated memory controller of its own or a system on chip, more appropriately for AMD, and that allows a direct line to the memory from the CPU. Desktop Horizon supports dual channel configurations for memory, whereas Threadripper supports quad channel configurations. For the chipset, AMD allows some motherboard manufacturer flexibility here, just like the Z370 chipset, by giving assignable lanes that can be switched around to other devices. If a motherboard maker is building a smaller board or wants to downcost the board, they can also remove some devices. Those lanes would just be left unused. The chipset can support up to 8 PCIe 2.0, 6 SATA 6 gigabit per second with RAID support, 2 USB 3.1 Gen 2, 6 USB 3.1 Gen 1, and 6 USB 2.0. Separately, note that all of AMD's current Ryzen chipsets allow overclocking, whereas Intel's overclocking is feature locked to the Z series and X series. We'll leave you with the most common chipset differences and an explanation of naming schemes. Intel's names include Q, B, H, Z, and X chipset prefixes. Without getting into all of the details, Q and B boards were originally meant for business, though B has been assimilated by gaming boards. H was meant as an affordable mainstream board with an H10, H blank 10, so H310, H210, and an H370, H270, and so forth board option. Z chipsets are the performance series and primarily differ in unlocked overclocking support. X chipsets are incomparable to these and support HEDT or high-end desktop CPUs like the 7980XE 18-core CPU. And these chipset names primarily include A, B, and X prefixes. And these B series and X series chipsets are officially unlocked for overclocking and primarily differ in price. B series boards tend to be a bit cheaper and X series boards tend to be more focused on overclocking, but that's not always a hard and fast rule. You need to check each individual board. As for the real differences, again, without getting into really the heavy details on these for this video, it's mainly the HSIO lanes and the amount of them, specifically on the Intel chipsets and a bit on the AMD ones. So as you look at B versus H versus Z, there'll be some differences, especially depending on generation of processor, where one might have 24 lanes, one might have 30, or something like that. And those lanes, again, it's not PCIe necessarily, it's just general purpose lanes can be assigned to lots of IO devices. So whether or not that matters to you depends on how much IO you need. 
The other main dividing feature is going to be overclocking for Intel on the Z series and the X series being somewhat of a shoot off where it's just high on desktop and of course is unlocked for overclocking. AMD supports unlocked overclocking on both of its mainstream and top end chipsets, which would be the B series and the X series. And if anyone's getting confused here, note that Intel and AMD both have B series chipsets. They both will have Z series chipsets as AMD's pushing one soon. And they also both have X series chipsets. So they are completely incompatible, of course. You wouldn't be able to put an Intel processor into an AMD CPU. So if you're asking if, if this is like brand new, never built a computer before question, and you're asking what's the difference between B360 and B350, the difference is one supports Intel and the other one supports AMD. So uh, obviously beyond that, the differences don't matter a whole lot. Just pick the one that fits the CPU first, figure out the rest later. And then finally, another important note here is that the chipset does not mean anything with regard to board quality. It might be kind of a toggle between overclocking and not, but beyond that, you don't know if the board actually overclocks well just because it's a Z series board. There are plenty of Z and even X370 boards that look the part or even price the part, but have awful VRMs and other components that would assist with overclocking. They might be lacking a clock gen, for instance, on some AMD boards. So it's a lot more than just the chipset. If you're trying to buy something for specific purposes, obviously look at the whole picture. We publish VRM analysis videos, as do other people like Buildzoid, who works on them for us. And those VRM analysis videos will help you figure out the rest of it beyond just the chipset difference. And uh, again, this is kind of a, a really beginner level thing, but a lot of people will just go towards the Z series or the X series boards simply because it seems like, well, they're the best. Technically, they are the most feature filled chipsets or should at least carry that appearance. But again, doesn't really mean a whole lot beyond that. It depends on the individual board. The motherboard makers still have a lot of control over their boards. Boards impact performance really heavily, and it's a common misconception that they don't. So be careful about what you're choosing, and of course, make sure the memory support is fitting for the memory you're choosing. And that's a different topic for another video. So uh, that's it for now. Last major thing to clarify, PCIe graphics lanes primarily come off of the CPUs. So kind of went over that a few times, but just to really make it clear, because a lot of people ask that one in our Ask GN series. So that's it for this one. As always, subscribe for more. Go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up one of our anti-static mod mats. They are available now and shipping as they are ordered. So if you're building a new computer and watching this because of that, maybe our mod mat can help you out. Thanks for watching. I'll see you all next time.